because we're doing a thin, small book at the back of the Old Testament, that means we can read the whole book, right? And you can say, what'd you do today, right? Somebody asks you, oh, I read a whole book of the Bible. You don't have to tell them which one it was. Uh, it's just... <laughs> But um, when we don't read uh, prophets like Joel, hey, they're worth a read. So that's, that's what we're doing uh, today. And we're going to relate it to the time of the coronavirus and the time of easing restrictions. So we we're at, uh, talking about a minor prophet at the back of the Old Testament. Uh, remember, the Old Testament has its Torah, the law, as well as its writings, uh, books like the Psalms, books like Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, uh, First and Second Kings, those are all part of the writings. But we have the prophets also. And the prophets always refer back uh, to uh, the law. And they also uh, integrate with uh, the uh, writings. So you're going to see that we're, we'll look at uh, how it relates to those uh, today, particularly with Joel. Joel, uh, let's see, whoop, got to try now. There we go. Remember, as we're reading Old Testament prophecy, we're reading Hebrew poetry. It's filled with images, uh, and we ought to take full advantage uh, of that. Uh, we ought to take advantage of uh, uh, the fact uh, that uh, not only we're, we're going to see uh, examples of uh, locusts today. Oh, and that has something uh, to say uh, to us as an Old Testament uh, prophetic image but it also corresponds uh, with uh, law and also with uh, the New Testament. And Joel, in fact, has a, a passage that uh, corresponds greatly with an event that we're going to celebrate uh, this Sunday, of all things, um, at church um, as uh, we look at uh, Pentecost and how this book is actually quoted at Pentecost, but we rarely take a look at it at uh, Joel in its original context. We've got some gems in these books, not frequently considered, uh, but they have some powerful words uh, for us today. And uh, particularly as we think of uh, apocalypse uh, and uh, uh, how that idea and thought was particularly prominent about a couple months ago as we were talking about the coronavirus and people were pointing us uh, to, oh, we, we have a, uh, an apocalyptic event. <laughs> and then yet we haven't looked at a small book like Joel that has some words, a few words to say about uh, apocalypse and particularly the day of the Lord. Let's do a little background first um, as we, before we dive into Joel. Who is this person, Joel, and what time period is he writing in? Who is Joel? Well, Joel 1 1 tells us this the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hmm. Who is Bethuel? <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> so that doesn't help us too much. And we don't have a correspondence with Joel in another place. So we unfortunately don't know too much uh, about uh, who Joel is. But his name means the Lord is God. So even in his, uh, his name is a, a strong expression of, of who uh, Yahweh is. Uh, he indeed uh, is the Lord, the, the sole uh, uh, ruler of this universe. When does this book date from? And unfortunately, scholars have this all over the map, but they generally tend to favor between 500 and 400 BC. So that would put Joel uh, looking back to the Babylonian exile. So he is a post-exilic prophet, if we, if we take it uh, that way. Why would we take him post-exilic? Uh, because there's... Um, uh, there's mention of priests and elders, but not of a king within the book, so that favors it slightly. Uh, he mentions no opposition from pagan cults like uh, uh, Hosea does. Uh, uh, so that makes us tend to think it's post-exilic, but uh, some would place it uh, earlier. But we don't have a king that we can really cause it to the book to correspond to. But in due diligence, now we've at least looked, and that's a help. Remember uh, about Israel and Judah, two separate kingdoms, the 10 northern tribes in Israel, uh, the two southern tribes uh, in Judah, and Joel is written to those in Judah. Both of these kingdoms were led astray, uh, led, led away into exile, Assyria 722, uh, Judah, uh, Judah in 586 BC. 
if we date uh, Joel uh, after the exile, he's writing after the Hebrew exiles have returned home from Babylon. Uh, remember that uh, exile, a very bad thing uh, from uh, our readings of the law, not good to go into exile, not good to go away. So Joel is writing after a recovery time. Who is ruling in Judah at that time? Well, not Jewish kings. Uh, they are either uh, under the uh, jurisdiction of uh, Xerxes, that's the picture on the left, or of Darius of Persia. Uh, so it might be uh, Jews who are ruling, but they're specifically under the influence of Persia. Well, a thought or a comment before we go any further? What were the Persians' beliefs? Oh, they were pagan, multi multiple different gods. Right. Uh, so it's, it's a polytheistic, uh, you know, polytheistic uh, religion. You know, they're not as heavy handed as the Babylonians, but yeah, go ahead, Bill. Was there mention, uh, cause I can't remember to a particular, I mean, again, you, you still have a lot of times, particularly under the Persian style with the decentralized, was there a particular from the, either the priestly class or one, it was sort of like, a, we'll say, top dog of the uh, of the group, the Jewish uh, leaders there. Ah, uh, you ask a very good question, uh, Bill. But I'm sorry, I can't answer further. That's that's a good one. Yeah, you all are asking good questions today. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't open it up for questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, they didn't have any centralized religion. I mean, would, 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 were were their beliefs based on the particular ruler and his? Yeah, uh, I mean, the Persians held to, to uh, it's, it's they, vaguely polytheistic, so. They had their own set of gods. They had their own set of gods, yeah. yeah. Because the, the Persians particularly was very syncretic and uh, with the Congress, they were like, yeah, it's a, a super wide uh, uh, tent on, on the thing. And I guess also in the period with the Jews, you still had a lot of power with the, the people who were uh, left behind and were, I mean, that's part of the Jewish political tensions between, uh, I guess, sort of almost the, some of the Sumerians, the Jews, and, you know, they're still struggling because, hey, hey, we've been here all along and you guys are just coming back. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, there, there are those type of tensions uh, that are, uh, are likely there too. It, it's, it would be really helpful if scholars had, you know, fixed this in a more uh, clear place. Um, but we just don't have it, unfortunately. Let's pick up an image of Joel and the locusts. Now, I, I remember my uh, grandfather or my uh, grandmother or even my mother joking about uh, the locusts are coming. Um, well, I mean, this is, this is amazing, uh, this image here, Joel 1, 2 through 4. Hear this, you elders, give ear, all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. All right, so three generations here. What the cu cunning locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. Ooh. How many locusts there? Uh, you got five locusts, cutting, swarming, hopping, uh, I'm sorry, four, uh, and then destroying locusts, as if there are at least four qualities of locusts. Uh, anybody heard of four qualities of locusts? Uh, <laughs> the locusts are really coming here, um, and uh, I've given at least a picture that looks somewhat apocalyptic uh, as these locusts eat everything uh, from, I guess, of house and home here. It should not be lost on us that locusts are a sign of the broken covenant. Deuteronomy 28, 37 through 38. And you shall become a horror, a proverb, and a byword among all the peoples where the Lord will lead you away. You shall carry much seed into the field and shall gather in little, for the locusts shall consume it. So locusts, uh, not merely uh, just a happenstance, but, I mean, this is something of, uh, uh, of uh, judgment. and. Uh, because Judah has forgotten the Lord. So what's the uh, likely uh, next uh, wording? Well, calls for repentance, right? Joel's, uh, Joel 1, 5 through 10. 
Awake you drunkards and weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. Lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn, the ministers of the Lord. The fields are destroyed. The ground mourns because the grain is destroyed. The wine dries up. The oil languishes. Wow. <laughs> Did that encourage you today? Probably <laughs> not. <laughs> Probably not. It keeps going. Joel 1, 11 through 15. I mean, if that wasn't bleak enough already from the five different types of locusts and uh, uh, drunkards and um, you know the wine going away, it keeps going. Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil. Wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine dries up, the fig tree languishes. Pomegranate, palm, and apple, all the trees of the field are dried up, and gladness dries up the children of man. Wow. Now we have an, an emotion drying up. If it wasn't bad enough that the wine was drying up, now gladness is dried up. Put on sackcloth and lament, O priests. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Go in past the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God, because grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near. Ooh. Now note that uh, little expression there, day of the Lord, because that's going to be a key idea here in Joel. The day of the Lord is near, and as destruction from the Almighty, it, it comes. So let me finish out Joel 1, and then we can talk a little bit about this, these images. Is not the food cut off before our eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seed shrivels under the, clod, the clods, the storehouses are desolate. The granaries are torn down because the grain has dried up. How the beasts groan. The herds of cattle are perplexed because there is no pasture for them. Even the flocks of sheep suffer. Whew. It is a heavy section. So naturally, Joel responds like this. To you, O Lord, I call. For fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and flame has burned all the trees of the field. Even the beasts of the field pant for you because the water brooks are dried up, and fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Okay, some of your thoughts and responses to this very, very bleak chapter. Well, it makes our, our references that we sort of have either in the U.S. to the Dust Bowl, and the desolation there, or I've seen some of the current pictures, of course, probably related to what you're using for the locusts. The, the famines and the locusts going in, I think to Kenya and to uh, Somalia, you know, you see that it's, it, it's not um, fake uh, imagery. That, and if you look at the, the thing on there, it's like, it's, it's bad. Yes. I'm curious, I'm not, what, what, what's a, a bug? Scientist, entomologist. Yeah, that would be an I'm entomologist. Not, I'm not a, a, an entomologist, but I'm curious what caused locusts to suddenly thrive one year and then be gone for years. I mean, locusts in general yeah. come around what every seven years. Yeah, yeah, every seven years. But yeah. why in such numbers? It might well be a sign. Part there's part of it when you when you look at the thing, even with a there's seven year locusts, and I think there's a twenty year locust and. The, the locusts that we see here, which are more circada, right. um, the locusts in there in uh, Africa are more of the uh, grasshopper type uh, when you look at how they go. And part of the, uh, the idea of swarming is a way of uh, a technique for being able to have mass reproduction because they can come in there, devastate it, and hopefully enough will be survived that they can lay their eggs and then whenever the cycle comes up again, um, 
they can uh, do their nasty deeds again. So there is some sense that they are cyclic. They are, they, they are cyclic, but what, what, I mean, some, particularly the ones in the United States, but some of the other ones, I don't think they have an understanding of what triggers it because it, I don't think it necessarily has to be timely like the ones, but it might be a set of conditions and, uh, mm. you know, it's, uh, I don't think there's a clear answer to some of that. It's sort of like swarming of bees. Sometimes you get to a certain state where it's a, a, a hive will swarm and you, you, don't, you can't predict exactly when that's going to occur. Yeah. The other question I have about this is I know sometimes they can um, uh, sort of pinpoint a specific point in time that an event like this happened. Uh, yep. I'm sure it's hard because of the, the, the time frame of this. Yep. Has anything ever been identified as, oh, yes, this happened? Uh, I'm just, we, we show a, a particular time point in time where there was a famine and so forth. Okay. Probably not. Definitely a famine and definitely some locusts, but they haven't been able to pinpoint this prediction of locusts. Yeah. So, yeah. S some of the stuff they do, I, again, not referring to this uh, time period, but some of the stuff, there's... <laughs> There seems to be a scientific specialty for everything. There's a lot of things where they ex actually look at the, the seeds and when they look at the layers to see what seeds or whether there's been ashes and things like that to try to see whether in a particular local area or in a broader area, whether there's been some sort of um, event. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. Sometimes when they're excavated and they can see remnants of a particular event. Yep. Yeah, they see a lot of times when you get it, if you start seeing different different seeds, changing in seeds, or if you come up with some old pottery and start trying to do some analysis or even scraping and looking for DNA, to see, you sometimes see that in, in climate when you got a change between wheat and barley and uh, you see because certain ones will, you, you'll lose the wheat because it can't handle certain temperatures the way uh, rye or barley can. Well, you can probably think of other uh, appearances of locusts in the Old Testament, right? Uh, especially, let's say, the time of the Passover in Egypt. That was one of the plagues. Um, but there are other, other times when locusts are anticipated. And uh, I'm not an entomologist. Uh, maybe next life. I don't know. <laughs> A bug's life. A bug's life. There we go. Uh, and how these things happen in the ancient uh, Near East is, is beyond me. Yeah. I do know that uh, it uh, corresponds with uh, the uh, prophesied judgments in uh, in Deuteronomy, and that uh, that shouldn't be lost on us as we read as we read Joel. Okay, now, oh, sorry, misspelling here. Have God's people felt this type of thing more in modern times? And I would say, actually, yes. Periodically, we do when we come to these crises points. Uh, and if you didn't read some of these headlines with the coronavirus. I thought maybe I'd expose you to some of those. Uh, these were just about oh, two months or so ago. And they took, uh, they were found in a whole variety of places. Uh, this is from uh, the United Kingdom's uh, paper, uh, The Guardian. Uh, and that's just a regular uh, newspaper, a normal daily newspaper in, uh, uh, out of London. Coronavirus prophecy, bizarre claim four horsemen of the apocalypse have arrived. Woo. All right. This is running uh, March 4th, 2020. So only a few uh, months or so ago, but they're picking up on sentiments of, uh, of uh, Christians in light of uh, the prophesy or in light of the anticipation of uh, the coronavirus coming to uh, Britain, that this is going to be apocalyptic. And of course that has a way of stirring people up. Uh, uh, I know Jeff and I were uh, uh, together when there were uh, when we heard uh, talks that oh maybe they'll call up the National Guard. I mean that was a couple week a uh, couple months uh, ago, and you know, nobody's saying that now, but as a way of stirring people up. Uh, um, and this was happening in a whole variety of places around the world. How about another UK um, uh, newspaper, February twenty first? It's post apocalyptic. Wow, how coronavirus has altered day to day life. Okay, and uh, now this uh, referring to what, what had taken place in Wuhan, uh, China. Was this only a UK uh, phenomenon? No. CNN ran this uh, 
uh, headline, March 23rd. Coronavirus is bringing a plague of dangerous doomsday predictions. Um, and they were uh, not themselves talking about doomsday, but they were talking about how many other people were uh, spouting off doomsday predictions in the Christian uh, uh, community. My guess is you've come across some of these books uh, in the past. How about this one? Uh, uh, Late Great Planet Earth uh, by Hal Lindsey. Uh, that was a very popular, um, uh, more fantastic presentation of the end times uh, back in the 70s. And then uh, Left Behind uh, made it uh, in the 90s and then in 2000, uh, early 2000. And all of these, uh, uh, whether it be headlines or whether these be books, have a way of stirring up the imagination to uh, uh, cataclysmic events where the Lord is involved. And um, um, I don't mind us talking about that, but I do mind us uh, talking about them, uh, let's say, uh, apart from texts uh, from the scripture that have something to say about them. And Joel has something to say, but before we let uh, Joel uh, speak further, Maybe you have some thoughts or comments on the ways that apocalypse has been talked about over the last few months. Go back to the CNN slide. Yeah. I, I find it interesting. They, they consider the predictions are a plague themselves. Bring a plague of predictions. Plague yes. of predictions. Yes, yes. The fact that the predictions are in and of themselves a plague. I'm wondering how CNN would view a prophet today if he showed up. <laughs> probably not too fair. Probably, probably not too fair. Yeah, probably not too fair. Yeah. But then I guess a prophet was always considered not being no, too no. too favorable either. Yeah. So. Well, one of the things that I see, and I, I find somewhat ironic because I'm certain that people are using the phrase are not religious, but they want to do it for a dramatic effect. Yeah. Uh, I saw particularly when there was the problem with the uh, ventilators and uh, lack of in New York, where you hear. It's a crisis of, or a disaster of biblical proportion. Yes. And you'll yes, hear that indeed. phrase being used. And I, I just think of, when I hear that, it, it, they're, they're trying to stir up the pot because I don't believe any of the people, based on their other behaviors, uh, have any belief in, in God at all. But it makes a nice sound bite. It does. I've always said, writers got to write. <laughs> and, and, and if you think about it, if, if you're tasked with turning out a story every day, you'll find something to write about. And this would be attractive to write about, right? I mean, yeah. some, something. Uh, so, I mean, it's going to grab eyeballs. It's going to grab yeah. clicks. It's called clickbait. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a motto in journalism school. And I think it was the original guy was a guy by the name of I think Tex McQuarrie, which and I think if you watch it, it's true. If it bleeds, it leads. Yeah. And you watch TV and why all the disasters, car crashes, and fires. I worry, though, that a headline like this where, you know, a plague of dangerous predictions is meant to paint Christians in a bad light. Look, yep. they all know about this apocalyptic uh, uh, message, uh, and they're spreading more of their crazy around. Yeah, I, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's some of that going on, okay? Uh, and it, it also doesn't help when some of the uh, more uh, inventive or interpretive ones are trying to, I'm thinking of some of the pastors, where they come out and really go off the deep end on the predictions. Yeah. And, you know, your problem is, you know, you, you paint a broad brush stroke, even though you're getting opinions of someone who, you know, would be considered extreme by everybody on the Christian side. Yep. Yep. You know, you couple that with some of the church shutdowns and not being allowed to open them back up, and you start to get a little bit of uh, paranoia about how certain people feel about uh, Christians. Yeah. Well, there's a church, I think it was in Alabama or Mississippi, that they finally got the order uh, from the, uh, um, the government or county to open the church. And this was like two days or three days after the church had been burnt down and there was some i don't know the exact uh saying but uh um did somebody left on the uh, ground of the amongst the fire um some like reopen your church now buster or something to that effect and 
you know, you were getting actually a, a, a tax onto the church that way. Yeah, they did determine that was arson, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. They there were signs and all. I mean, it was it was not an accident. There were there were messages left on the uh, in, uh, near the uh, rubble. Joyce, do you have anything you want to add about uh, apocalyptic in, uh, in modern thought? Well, I just looked up the word, the meaning of plague. Yeah. Uh, and the virus could fit in the cat that cat category yeah. where we don't all have the virus, uh, but it, it affects all of us in one way or another. Um, so I feel that Certainly the Lord is in charge, and if he wants to wipe this virus out, he could do it in a minute. But he hasn't chosen to do that yet. So I don't know. It certainly doesn't feel like the locust plague or some of those other plagues where everybody's affected um, in that uh, degree. Mm -hmm. So I guess the virus then could be considered a plague whether that is uh, a Christian uh, thing. I don't, I don't know that. I don't know if that's something that God is allowing to get people to realize that he's in charge. And we're not, regardless of our intelligence, our position, our money. Yep. Um, we just have to, I hope people realize that that they can't change it <laughs> themselves. Good point. And you, know, you brought up the, uh, the virus being a plague. Uh, I'm, I'm going to even just shift it a, a little bit further because we're particularly talking about apocalyptic here, uh, not only right. just uh, uh, something that might be somewhat oppressive, but uh, um, some of the headlines that came out in, in, in March were uh, almost end of the world uh, type of, uh, of things. And I, I don't mind talking about end of the world, but I think we ought to at least frame it in a, in a biblical narrative in some way. Well, let's uh, let Joel too have a word for us. Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming, it is near. Okay, all right, here we have the phrase day of the Lord again. All right, we've seen it once before. Now here it comes, and it's going to, Joel 2 is going to describe what it is. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness, there is spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people. Their like has never been before, nor will be again after them through the, the years of all generations. Fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like war horses they run. As with the rumbling of chariots, they leap on the tops of the mountains, like the crackling of a flame of fire devouring the stubble, like a powerful army drawn up for battle. Okay. Darkness, gloom, looks like legions being set, uh, uh, set on edge here. We keep reading, Joel 2. Before them, peoples are in anguish. All, all faces grow pale. Like warriors, they charge. Like soldiers, they scale the wall. They march each on his way. They do not swerve from their paths. They do not jostle one another. Each, one, each marches in his path. They burst through the weapons and are not halted. They leap upon the city. They run upon the walls. They climb up into the houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. Any thoughts on this or comments? Uh, it's fearful. Somebody's got a pretty, I don't want to say imagination, but the, the, the images that they're creating are, are incredible. Yes. Yes, and, and prophetic literature is filled with this type of thing. Yeah. Yep. Well, one thing, and we sort of think about the, the, uh, the darkening and all, and the image of what happened when, um, when Christ died, and the, the darkening and the uh, renting of the uh, temple um, 
curtain or whatever. I mean, in, in a way, you're sort of seeing there, this is almost a prefiguring of, of that type of thing. Very much so. You've been looking at my notes. That's uh, where I was going next, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> um, just reading in Luke 23, although it's uh, recorded in the other Gospels, uh, at least three of them. Uh, it was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed and the c curtain of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle when they saw what had taken place returned home beating their breasts. Um, yeah, you can find this uh, apocalyptic language uh, from Joel uh, at the crucifixion. Sun being dark, uh, uh, moon... Uh, 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 not uh, 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 able to shine as well. And then with the, the uh, earthquake, as it was recorded in uh, some of the other Gospels, I mean, that is, has apocalyptic um, uh, uh, imagery uh, to it. One other place where uh, we can look for this type of apocalyptic uh, imagery, not surprising, the book of Revelation. This is uh, chapter 6, when uh, Jesus is on the throne as the Lamb um, uh, who is worthy to be praised. He's given a scroll, and he is the only one who is able to open the seals. And the first uh, four happen to be the uh, horsemen of the uh, apocalypse. Uh, when we get to the sixth seal, uh, we know the sun has turned to blood, which has Joel language in it, too. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth, and the fig tree shed its winter fruit when shaken, uh, when sh uh, shaken uh, by a gale. So here we have uh, Joel language uh, once again uh, with uh, a cataclysmic uh, um, uh, imagery uh, now uh, anticipated uh, in the future when the Lamb is on the throne. Comment or thought on Revelation or on uh, Luke? Well, the, the one thing, the imagery that they uh, mentioned, uh, you can actually have that in reality. When you look at some, and thinking here when they talk about earthquakes, uh, I think when you have the uh, uh, eruption of Krakatoa, I think in the late 1800s, but some of the other things when you see the literature, you get the sun turning red because of all the dust in the air. And it doesn't take too long before the volcanic ash is starting to circulate through the, uh, through the atmosphere and causes all sorts of things and called cloning. That's where some of the things I think they hypothesize, like when you had some of the middle, mini earth, uh, mini ice ages in the uh, um, 1600s or so, where it was a result of a big volcanic eruption yeah i don't think i don't get the idea these are just images they dreamt up these are yeah. images of things they actually saw yeah 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 well, let's keep reading in joel here what's the natural thing to do when these uh, uh fantastic images are in front of us return to the lord <laughs> the lord utters his voice uh, before his army for his uh, camp is exceedingly great he who executes his world word is powerful for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. I think that's really interesting that uh, we throw the uh, divine name in there in its explanation. It makes sense, return to the Lord, right? When we uh, could be scared out of our wits, really. really. But, uh, remember who the Lord is, compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. That's the way he was first, in fact, uh, introduced to God's people years ago when his name was explained. And this took place um, uh, at the uh, giving of uh, the Ten Commandments, uh, actually the re-giving of the Ten Commandments, when uh, the Lord passes in front of Moses and says, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. It's almost a, a word for word uh, in Joel. 
return to the Lord. Not no, uh, simply because uh, there's a fantastic event uh, that could be coming, but because God's good, because he's compassionate, because he's great, um, and he loves uh, his people. So summarizing from what we've seen of this depiction of the day of the Lord, uh, it's a time of God's judgment. It is scary to the non-believer and the one who pushes God away uh, as God himself reveals himself. The day of the Lord has some very interesting parallels to the crucifixion, as well as uh, anticipation of future judgment in Revelation 6. But the call has been, and it's still always been, return to the gracious and compassionate God, as he has done so, uh, uh, given this uh, calling uh, throughout the Old Testament. Common or thoughts at this point? Oh, the one point, your second uh, bullet item about scary to the non-believer, uh, if you think about it, at least watching the reactions to all the things with the pandemic, the people that seem to be the most hysterical about the things, about again, about all the doom and, and the stuff, are the people that have no faith. Yep. And, and, and you know, it, 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 it's up for obvious reasons what we go through. But if you notice that, it just seems, and that's where you look at, and I think that's some of the reasons why when you see some of the, the cities and all the do where you have basically, I hate to use the phrase, the most godless, but at least we'll say the extreme secularism, they're the ones that are panicking the most, and those are the ones that seem to have the biggest problems because everybody's doing their own thing, so they don't bother to wear the mask. Or, you know, you see the examples where everybody's still gathering in crowds for the, you know, the beach parties and all the cases where you see um, people doing, you know, silly things. They tend to be the areas where they have people that really aren't faithful. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed that we're sitting here talking about how certain of these things, the the sun turning red, blood red, and so forth, we can now, given our years of science and education and so forth, we can explain some of these things. Back then, they didn't have the science to back up or explain any of this stuff. So I'm sure it made it that much scarier to them. And yeah. and and Especially yeah. if, if you were pagan, you'd go, okay, the gods are angry. Yep. Not God, but yep. the gods. The gods. Yep. Um, yep. One wonders if we're getting the message today, though. Well, that's the question. Yeah, And, and have we? Um, and, and maybe science has explained too many things for us. We all try See, I, I look at it with some of the things with the science. So to me, it's like, okay, it's, it's showing that it wasn't, I mean, yes, you had the people being uh, afraid, but if you look at it, I look at it so much as God's using natural phenomena as part of his own plan. So to me, it doesn't wind up being taken away. If anything, it makes the, the stuff that we read about in the past even more credible. But he's in control of it all, so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We've got about seven minutes left. I'm not sure if I'm going to be good on my promise to have you read through all of Joel today, but I'm going to get you at least to this uh, section because Joel's going to take a surprising turn all of a sudden. After all this doom and gloom and the call for repentance, then we've got this surprising turn in the emergence of the Spirit where we read these words at the end of Joel 2. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. All right. Now this is an interesting uh, prophecy because it shows up in Acts 2, right at Pentecost. Remember Pentecost, uh, fires of flame uh, on each of the disciples. They all start speaking in a language that uh, those who were visiting Jerusalem said, oh, they're speaking in a language that I understand. And then uh, Peter has this interaction with the crowd. 
And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, they're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. Wow, here's this small little book in the Old Testament. All of a sudden, now we're referencing him. And it's a rather lengthy quote. And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall see dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, meaning pouring it out on all. And they shall prophesy, meaning speaking of the, the greatness and wonders of, of, of the Lord. And I shall show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thoughts or comments on this? It's a surprising uh, uh, piece in uh, Joel, isn't it? That is from Acts. Yep. Now, the last part is come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Can you go back to the part from Joel? Yep. Because it also said that there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls, yep. meaning called home. Call, um, uh, call, call to him. I mean, it looks like in Joel, called home. Right. But it seems like in Acts, it's turned to call on his name, believe in him, okay. as Peter preaches, preaches the great Pentecost sermon. I sort of read that as some of, yep. some of you are going to make it and some of you aren't. And then in Acts, in Acts it looked like you're all good. Maybe I'm just saying it that way. You're all good if you call upon the name of the Lord right. for salvation. Yeah. 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 Any thoughts, Joyce or uh, Bill? That's I find good. it interesting, in, in particularly when we're looking at, at this part, is I re read that section, you know, uh, as probably we all have numerous times, but I really didn't, it didn't really hit me about Joel and thinking back until we're actually looking at it right now. And now it's like, well, yeah, okay. So I, I, find, that, I find that interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, again, it's another one of these, links back or, or forward, depending upon which direction you're going in, that is just, it's just, I, you know, it's something, okay, amazing if you want to look at it. Yes. Okay, we've got about two minutes left, so I'm going to have to do this. I'm going to summarize very uh, quickly Joel 3, uh, where God's people will be restored, but there will be greater consequences for those who continue to push uh, uh, the Lord away, as is always the case. Um, uh, you know, return to the Lord is is uh, is the key idea within Joel uh, uh, overall, and that leads to being rescued out of uh, this these calamities. But if you're going to continue to push away, don't be surprised if um, the consequences are going to be greater. Let's read the last few verses in Joel, starting at seventeen. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain, and Jerusalem shall be holy, and strangers shall never again pass through it. And in that day the mountains shall drip sweet with wine, instead of being dried up and shriveled like we read in Joel 1, now they're sweet with wine. And the hills shall flow with milk, and all the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water, and a, mount, and a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord, and, and water the valley of Shittim. Egypt shall become a desolation, and Edom a desolate wilderness, for the violence done to the people of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall be inhabited forever, and Jerusalem to all generations. I will avenge their blood. I have not uh, I'll avenge their blood, blood that I have not avenged, for the Lord dwells in Zion. In short, he will right the scales to make every uh, wrong right and uh, judge uh, appropriately at the end. Um, just on the coronavirus, Joel on the day of the Lord. Yes, uh, there were certainly apocalyptic elements earlier in the crisis, and we did have them, and they did rile people up. And I think Bill, as he said, largely the non-believer. Uh, from reading from uh, Joel, 
uh, though we do know that God's uh, apocalypse will take place when it will take place at the end of time. Uh, we're not exactly sure. But the call is always to retor- return to the Lord. Um, and if uh, this uh, uh, crisis uh, certainly is under uh, God's hand and has been under his hand, uh, if we're all starting to think more about returning to the Lord, then that's a good thing. And judgment can be scary. And it is scary indeed uh, when we're talking about the Lord who is creator and sustainer of the world. But if we're on the Lord's side and have trusted him, then indeed all will be well. I just think that it's, it is very timely considering all the stuff that's going on for us to be looking at that. And it's, uh, you know, throughout there, you see, it's, it's very topical. I'm just thinking they keep talking about this second wave coming back, and I'm sort of thinking that's God saying, okay, here's how bad it can be. You've had a chance. Think about it. Get your act together. And if there's a second wave, it's like, mm, told you so. You know, gave you a fair warning. The, the other thing when I think about it, this is part of the things where, you know, people don't look at history. If you consider the uh, Black Death in the uh, Middle Ages, uh, the plague, I think at that point, something like 30 to 40 percent of uh, Europe's population was killed off. Yeah. And even even uh, Martin Luther and his uh, um, wife and all were, were trying to take in some of the survivors and the devastation and the impact that it had on uh, society. The, the plague was one of the things that really broke down the entire feudal system because there weren't enough people to be working the fields afterwards. Yeah. And it changed the direction of uh, European society. Did that cataclysm... Who knows what events are going to be happening as a consequence of what we're seeing now. People are, of course, making all sorts of predictions about the new normal. I'm curious whether that cataclysmic event and things like, what, 1918, the Spanish book, did that change the course of the church at all? Was there any revival right after that? I mean, Not so really. we, we've had these events yeah. and has it really driven people back to the church? In America, um, I can't think of something that corresponds. There was a, there was a Welsh revival yeah. around the 1900s. And driven by some events? I don't know it well enough. Yeah. I'm sorry, but I mean, that's a good question. Yeah, it's one for the history people. Yeah, yeah. You did not see, I, I can't say for Christian revival, but if you look at some of the things with the, uh, the Black Death, uh, that was the impetus for a lot of the start of the Jewish persecutions. And there was a lot of the things where they were accusing the Jews of bringing the plague. And that's part of some of the histories where you start seeing the, uh, the beginning of, in modern times. Uh, of you know the animosity towards the Jews. That's interesting because in New York, uh, I know a lot of the Orthodox Jews were continuing to hold funerals, and there was a lot of uproar. I think even down to De Blasio, mm-hmm. accusing them of uh, "What are you doing? You know, you're you're helping spread the the virus," and and like it, a lot of condemnation of the Jews. That yeah, I, I think that part when when I saw some of that. It was sort of like history repeating itself. Yeah. Because if you think back in the time when the Jews were in, in New Europe, they were not permitted typically to own land. They uh, uh, they had to be in, and that's why you see the predominance in a lot of uh, professions. The only jobs they were allowed to have were things like banking and um, um, law and what went for medicine back then. And they, so they were in the city, and of course, that's part of the problem because with the plagues, you'll see more simply because of the concentration of the people. Yeah. Mm-hmm.